Well, they, they will. I always say anybody who's listening to me speak must, they need to get a better life. <laughs> All right. Don't flatter hey. yourself, Marshall. Hey, Marshall, thank you very much. I used to watch it every, every Sunday because Wednesdays I was busy at 11 o'clock or whenever it was. But, oh, my uh, God. But That's I always a, watched it on Sundays. Yeah. You know what? I, I watch She Urim all the time uh, because I, I sometimes I just I want to watch other things for entertainment. But I, I, uh, I enjoy I like learning. You know, it's uh, it's a passion. Your uh, Rochama's exactly. husband, Rochama's husband taught me that in the world of music and Chazanut, he said you're a, he this is when he was already in his late 70s he said to me you're a student all of your life that's exactly how he said it and he's right and it doesn't matter what area you're in or what area what area you uh, your passion is for you're always a student and uh, i always love trying to yes. learn and exactly as is written azu khakham halomed mikol adam mikol adam it's right the one who learns from every person and it's from true every person you can learn something from a little child and you can learn something from an old man yeah and there's another thing you can learn sometimes you can learn from other people what not to do exactly very good <clears throat> all right so we finished off with a really what i think is an interesting topic um and I think of it as being very relevant today, but it's not just relevant today. It was relevant in the past, too. It's just that people um, didn't give it the recognition that maybe they should have. And it was the idea of a transgender surgery. And there were many opinions. I didn't go through all of the strict opinions. And there were strict opinions that started off lenient and then later became strict. They, they changed their mind halfway through. Um, and I finished off by saying that, um, to quote my teacher, where, when he said to me, he said, I, I, I'm very happy. He said, how happy I am not to be the rabbi of a synagogue that has to make those decisions um, as to, to where a trans person should sit. In other words, if you were in a, in a shul and like ours, it's not an issue. You sit wherever you want. But imagine, you know, you're walking into an Orthodox synagogue and they have a mechitza and the people there are, are disrespectful in the sense that they're not treating you the way that you feel you um, are supposed to be treated and deserve to be treated. And that is that the, the concept becomes, um, how do you, how do you reconcile a <coughs> congregation to understand that the idea is, is what you see is what the person is and um you know there's torah and then there's the opinion of all of our uh, our sfarim our books uh particularly ravavadya yosef i spoke about uh, uh him and moshe feinstein and i spoke about the tzitz eliezer rav yehuda waldenberg who was actually the one of the most lenient um surprisingly i mean he's a very uh uh strict to the right rabbi and he brought up an idea that a concept where he said forget about everything else if you see someone who is dressed like a female acts like a female identifies as a female then what you see is what it is and uh and i don't i don't mean it uh disrespectfully i, I i'm using it with full respect saying that that's how the person identifies that's how we're supposed to respect him and personally, for me, if somebody identifies as a female, then and they want to sit on the uh, the women's side of the mechitza, then go ahead. If you're going to identify as a male, then go ahead. But if you're going to do that, understand that how you are identifying. And if you've had surgery already, you know, lechatchila to begin with, you're not supposed to have the surgery because um, the idea of um, serus of castration was forbidden by the Torah, whether it was for animal or for man. But once something has happened, it's already passed, it's already done, then guess what? I, I use the example of the animal. The person doesn't disregards Torah and he castrates the horse. Does he have a female horse after he castrates the horse? No, he doesn't have a female horse. He has a dead horse because the horse died. If the horse dies, you have a dead horse. So the thing is, is if the person is alive and the person is already castrated and the person is identifying as a female, all kidding aside, I'm not joking here, I'm being very serious, 
then that person has every right to deservedly being, be treated as a female. And Rav, Rav uh, Eliezer Yehuda Waldenberg said that halachically, the gender flips from one side to the other. And if the gender flips, that means they are no longer bound by Torah mitzvot if they're flipping to a female and um, they uh, halachically are only responsible as a female, no longer as a male. They no longer have the mitzvah of, um, of uh, pru or vu or priya or via as we would refer to it. Um, they no longer have the mitzvah of uh, shofar. Shofar is one of the biggest mitzvahs of the Torah, right? So <clears throat> you give up certain mitzvot. Similarly, when I wrote my exam uh, on that, I gave an opinion and he, the, the rabbi didn't think of that. He, he said it was an interesting comment. I said, in a similar sense, it's when somebody who is a Kohen marries um, someone who is converted. A Kohen is not allowed to. So if a Kohen does that, or somebody who was previously divorced, a Kohen is not allowed to marry someone who was divorced, then the Kohen, uh, according to the Ketubah, you'll see on the Ketubah, it no longer says the word Kohen. On the Ketubah, actually, it's removed, that, that, that word Kohen. It's, you're, not, you're not Moshe Benachem ben Yeshiyahu HaKohen anymore. Not that I'm a Kohen, but you, that, that is removed. Um, I'll give you a personal example, and then we're going to go forward. When I married Laura, in a sense, I, I took on these two children. Laura decided to go through, undergo an Orthodox conversion before that we got married. Not be, nothing to do with our marriage, but she was converted many, many years ago under Reform Rabbi. And she disord, decided to go to a Beit Din and convert uh, Orthodox. And when she did that, um, Tristan, who is the son of a Kohen, this is interesting, by the way, and you're, you're going to go past that, ha, was told you are not going to be regarded as a Kohen. But it, interestingly, he should have never been regarded as a Kohen. He was thinking he's a Kohen. He was not a Kohen to begin with because Laura married Brian. Brian was a Kohen. On their original ketubah by the Reform Rabbi, which I have and I've seen, it actually says ha Kohen. But how could he be a Kohen? if he married somebody who converted? And the answer is that, the answer is that um, the reform movement disregards all of those halachot. They don't care. So in other words, you're a Kohen, I don't care if you marry someone who divorced or converted, you're still a Kohen, and they, and they, they regard that. So it depends on which stream of Judaism you are following and which rabbis you follow. And we're going to see that same stream of methodology of how different rabbis follow different rulings and opinions according to the Talmud in the next topic. And what is the next topic that we're starting today? I always like to finish off with what we did last week. You know, you do a little bit just to remember, we want to refresh and going forward, we're starting an area which is of interest to some, not of interest to everyone, but the, it's the idea of hat, hamatat chesed, hamatat chesed, mercy killing, let's call it, or euthanasia, um, and um, assisted suicide, um, assisted dying. You know, there's all kinds of words and terminology and different ways to express how one feels. I remember, I always share personal stories because when you share a personal story, it's something you can relate to because you all have your own personal stories that are going to be very, very similar to this. I'm not unique. Well, I'm unique as I'm crazy, but I'm not unique because of the, uh, the, uh, the, my, my personal experiences. I remember when my mother and father made the decision that they were going to move into uh, Baycrest. They were there at the same time, by the way, as, uh, as Grisha, as Louis Danto. And Louis never gave up being the, uh, the, the uh, even though he was in Baycrest, even though he could barely walk, even though he was in a wheelchair, it didn't matter. He still acted like he was the clergy of the whole place. He was going around and visiting other people from the shul that he knew from the community, even though he was in the hospital himself, he was going and visiting other people because he felt it was his re responsibility to, to visit people. 
ביקור חולים. So my father and mother, you know, when you go to Baycrest, that you have this, what they call a quality of life initial meeting, and we're there, and there's a team of uh, two doctors and uh, some other, and a social worker, or maybe she was a, uh, an MSW, a master of social work, uh, maybe, she, maybe there was a psychiatrist there, you think I remember it was 2000 and uh, uh, like six or something, and we're sitting around this table, and they bring up the idea of what do we do in case, in case of what? Well, in case like, uh, are we going to do heroics if you get sick? Do you want a DNR, a DNR? I thought it was like a brand of a car. Like, a, no, I like, I drive a Toyota. <clears throat> I didn't even know what a DNR was. And the DNR is a do not resuscitate order. And I was thinking in my head when they brought that up, I'm like, what kind of a question is that? Of course they don't want, they, they're, they're not interested in that. They, my, my father, no, not a million years like that. And my father just pipes up like that at the meeting and he goes, yep, we both want a DNR. And I'm going, oy vez mir. I couldn't believe that they just said it just like that. They didn't even think about it. It wasn't even a thought. It was just like, we don't want, we, we want a DNR. We want, it, we want a DNR, I'm sorry. Meaning they wanted an order for do not resuscitate. My father said, if I'm in that position, what do I wanna be lying there with tubes in my chest and they're forcing me to, to breathe on a machine and I'm gonna lie there on a ventilator and they're gonna keep me alive and suffering for absolutely no reason. And they both wanted it. So I started to research, I do not resuscitate. What does that mean? It means that if my father at that time was going to have a heart attack, um, they wouldn't do all these heroic measures to try and save him, let him die in peace. But look what I said. Let him, I didn't say let's kill him in peace. I said, let him die in peace. There's a difference. So habatat chesed, we know what the word chesed means, it means um, to have um, like an act of righteousness. You know, we always call the act of the last act of uh, doing a burial as uh, chesed shall emet. So we're going to have chesed. We're going to have rachmanus. We're going to have rachamim. We're going to have mercy. We're going to have thought. So what does the Gemara say? We got to look at the Talmud. The Gemara says in Masechet Sanhedrin, okay, in, in the book of Sanhedrin, it says that if someone has committed a crime punishable by capital punishment and has to be put to death, the Gemara says, Bror lo mita yafa. Bror lo mita yafa. You must choose a mita yafa, a nice death for the convict. If you're gonna put someone to death, you have to choose a nice death. What does that mean, a nice death? A bullet in the head, let's kill him fast with a bullet in the head? Or does it mean, let's slowly strangle the person so that they suffer and while they're strangling, let's uh, chop him up in pieces and cut his legs off while he's being strangled, like the Romans would do things like that. Or suffering, like, the, like in England, when I was around the area of, um, London, near the Tower of London, they still have one of the original on top of this pole. Have you seen it? It's called the bird cage. Has anybody seen the bird cage? Faye has. Faye writes everything down. She probably has notes on it. <clears throat> Faye has a binder on everything. She's a walking travel log, right? Faye, you have everything. The bird cage was a cage that they would stuff a person into put them up on the pole and they would let you just stand, lie there and you would stand there and die until the birds would peck at you, you'd starve to death, you would suffer. It was an awful way of dying, a horrible punishment. Well, maybe they would do that to someone who was thought to be a witch or whatever it is. But here the Gemara is saying, Bror lo mitayafa. Find a mitayafa, a beautiful mita, a beautiful bed, a nice death, for the convict, a nice death. So let's think about um, someone who has been sentenced to death. 
uh, we, in most humane countries, if we do have um, capital punishment, I, I hope, I mean, I don't know what they're doing in Florida these days. Did they still have old Sparky? I mean, is, is an electric chair a nice, uh, a nice way to kill somebody? Uh, not really. Um, um, did anybody ever watch The Green Mile? It was a movie. I, I could only watch it once. A horrible movie, you know? And, and um, um, it's not, it's not a, a nice thing because what happens afterwards? Do you know how many people were killed senselessly, meaning they were convicted wrongfully of murder, wrongfully convicted, sentenced to death to hanging or an electric chair or something like this, and then we find out afterwards, oops, it's the wrong person. We, we, we did the, it's awful. It's not even funny. And now we have lethal injection. So lethal injection, is that humane? Well, I, I don't wanna have to make a choice for myself, God forbid, I'll try and be a good boy. But if I was in that position, I'm sure I would take the lethal injection over all the others. But the thing is, is, I'm choosing something for myself now. Even that apparently has failed many times and has not been successfully done. So if we are supposed to try and find a nice death for the person, according to the Gemara, once we take the Gemara, we take what the Talmud says, and we move forward into history, and we see what the Shulchan Aruch says, the Table of Laws by Rav Yosef Karo, it says, it starts off with a word that is taken directly from the Talmud with the word hagoses. What's a goses? Larry knows what a goses is. It's a person who is terminally ill and, uh, and is uh, in the last stages of life. Correct. And, he's, uh, and, and they're dying. Correct. You know what you said that the, 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 the end they're dying is very important. You know, they're in the last stages of life and they're dying. Um, so you're a hundred percent correct. I couldn't have said it better than that. A ghost is someone who is about to die. That's the term. You're going to hear that word a lot. Ghosts. It's a term you'll never forget. If I come to you in five years from now, and I say to you, what's a go says? You're going to know because you've learned it here. And um, I just think it's such an interesting topic that I, 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 you just don't forget it. Rabbi Tendler said that the word go says is used as an expression for someone who is dying. And he used this term, this way of saying it. He said, it's a person whose clock is winding down. It's interesting. A clock is winding down. You know, it might slow down. It starts to tick slower. And eventually, what happens to that watch or that clock? If it's the winding, you know, clocks, they had windings. They have springs in it. And the spring is wound up. And the spring, he's a 20-year-old and a 30-year-old. And, and then the clock gets to a point where the clock is winding down and eventually it just stops. The clock stops. It's not really a morbid topic at all. It's an interesting topic because for all of us, the, our, clock, our clock stops in this world. But then we have maybe hopefully a clock that starts in another world, right? But the idea is, that someone who is about to die, someone who is about to die, because Larry said, the person is dying. They're not dead, they're dying. What does that mean for that person halachically? It means halachically they have a status of being alive. If you're not dead, you're alive. Therefore, what happens? Okay, the Talmud says, you cannot sew up his cheeks. That's the quote. You cannot sew up his cheeks. What does that mean, sew up his cheeks? So back in those days, back in those days, they did different things than we even do today. You know, you can look up all of the rules and halachas, and there's a book called uh, 
uh, Morning in Halacha. It's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Uh, everybody should own it on their bookshelves. If you don't own it, buy it. Morning in Halacha. Do I have it here? Let me see. I'll bring it for you next week. The reason I suggest it is because it has every single opinion and every single rule and every single law and every single idea of what happens in the morning process and what they did and how they did it. You know, today they put a piece of wood, they put pieces of ceramic on your eyes when they bury you, they put a plate, they bury you with a talit, they cut off the corner of one of the tzitzit to make it pasul. There's all of these rules. But in those days, they actually sewed up the cheeks and they did that to prepare the body as part of the tahara for burial it's like anointing we have our way of anointing we do it by tahara with water <clears throat> and um the uh, by the way did you know that in tahara when you prepare a body a woman's body is prepared differently than a man's body. First of all, you know that a woman's body is only handled by women from the, um, the, the society, not by, there's no men involved, and the men's bodies are handled by men. But apart from that, and all of the dignity that goes along with Tahara, I can't remember how they do it, but I believe that one of us, the man or the woman, I don't remember because I've never done Tahara. By the way, it's one of the biggest mitzvahs, if you ever, but it, it is, is one of them is actually dipped below the water and one of them is just washed like over top. I, I, I'm not sure which is which. I believe the women are just rinsed, like they pour water over top. It's That's a, a ritual washing. Why do we even do that? We do it for different reasons because um, it's a purification. It's like going to the mikvah. You know, if somebody has a tattoo, I don't mean a tattoo from where I, 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 that is not by choice. Like we're talking about survivors of the Holocaust. I mean a tattoo like someone decides they want an anchor on their arm. You know what I mean? Or something says the mother on their arm and they get a tattoo and they like it. And then they realize afterwards, oh, I didn't realize I was not observant. I didn't know I'm not supposed to get a tattoo and deface my body, but I already did it. It's too late. Once you go to the mikvah, Halakhically, the tattoo has disappeared, which means the tattoo is there, but because you've gone to the mikvah for the conversion process, it's as if the tattoo is gone, if somebody had it beforehand. It's a ritual cleansing. So when you rinse a body, when you rinse a body, you're preparing it for burial. You cannot rinse the body to prepare it for burial until the body is dead. You don't take someone who's, they're dying already. Let's get this going. Call Benjamins now. They're not dead yet, but we know they're going to die by tomorrow. You know, like, like Ellie shaking her head. Do you know in my 29 years, how many times I have been in hospital rooms where a spouse or a child starts talking about the funeral, the arrangements, the burial, who's going to officiate, what they're going to sing. Huh? What, well, Larry, you're saying no? That's forbidden. It's completely oh, it's forbidden. You're right. Yeah. It's 100% forbidden. It's 100% forbidden, but it's done because they don't know. And they're saying, Marshall, will you officiate the funeral? I go, we're not talking about that now. We're not allowed to talk about it. Let's not talk about it. The person hasn't died. You're not allowed to stand there in the room and talk about, let's discuss how we're going to do a Tahara. Or is it going to be at Steele's? Is it going to be at Benjamin's? Is it going to be at Hero Basic? Where we got to buy a plot? You don't talk about buying a plot in the room while the person's lying there. Even if you think that the person is not aware it does not matter if the person is aware or not aware it's halakhically not allowed and they say it um, uh, in this case uh, 
Um, Rabbi Tendler says that you cannot rinse the body. The Shulchan Aruch says you cannot rinse the body. You, you, you cannot start to prepare someone for burial until the, you cannot stop up the person's bowels in preparation for burial, the Shulchan Aruch says. You cannot remove, you're going to hear this over and over, you cannot remove the pillow from under the person's head. Why would I remove a pillow? Because if I have the person propped up, maybe I'm helping them breathe. I'm making them more comfortable. Here, dear, let me put the pillow and raise it up for you a little bit so it'll be easier for you. I want you to have an easier time, but the person is laboring and they're breathing in a challenging way. And it's awful for us to watch. We don't want to watch it. We don't want to see this person suffer at all. And they've given medication and they've done what they can do to help this person be comfortable. And I think to myself, you know what? If I just take the pillow, I'm helping mom or my wife or my husband or anyone. I'll just take the pillow away. By removing that pillow, you are in violation of halacha because you are assist, you're helping the person die. You are helping the person die by removing the pillow because I want the person to die at this point. I want the person to die peacefully. I don't want the person to live anymore. This person should not suffer. I love this person too much. I don't want them to die. I cannot compare an animal to a human being, but I'm going to tell you a story. Faye knows a little, Esther knows. Recently, my dog Quincy was extremely sick. The dog, an animal. The dog was crying. We took him in. They thought it might have been kidneys. Um, The dog was suffering. He could not even walk. He couldn't walk. And his legs, he couldn't stand up. And Quincy was was, uh, on his side, and I had to turn him over. And then he cried when I turned him over. So I phoned the vet. I said, I got to bring him. We got to put this dog down. The dog's not well. There's something wrong. And I, I, I can't watch him suffer. So... The vet said, I don't think, anyway, so I brought the dog in, they did some tests, he didn't figure it out. The dog, I bring him home, he's still suffering. Walking like an old man, barely hanging on. I, all of a sudden in the middle of the night, I woke up and I remembered that there was this time when I walked him recently, when after I walked him, he started walking very gingerly. This dog lunged at him, another dog, and then he started walking funny. So I said, I wonder if he hurt his back or did something to himself. So I phoned the vet and I said, I wonder if this is possible. He says, it is possible. He says, maybe that's the problem. Maybe he dislocated a disc or, or something like that and it's causing pain and that's the problem. He gave me um, galaprant, a, a drug. It's, a, it's a, like a, a pain, uh, an anti-inflammatory. I gave the dog the anti-inflammatory and Quincy's running around the house like a mishiga now. He's up and down the stairs, he's running around, he's eating his food, he's walking like there's nothing wrong with him. I thought the dog's dying, but the dog wasn't dying. The dog needed some medication. I was ready to pull the pillow from underneath the dog's head and let him go. I said, I can't watch him suffer. All he needed was a couple of pills. And now he's like, I don't know if how long, but whatever it is, the reason is, is that he was not dying. You cannot remove the pillow from under someone's head because you're helping them die. Well, you cannot put the person on the ground until he or she is actually dead. You cannot put a person's belly or bowel or rake a container or a jar of water, nor a lump of salt until they are dead. What does that mean, a lump of salt? You are not, we'll talk about that. You are not allowed to announce a funeral. You can't send out, you know, the in Israel, if you've ever heard this, if you're like in an area like Mea Sha'arim or Ramat Shlomo, they call them the sound trucks. You know, when a great Rebbe dies, like recently, um, Rabbi Kanievsky passed away. So when Rav Kanievsky passed away, right away they want to announce the death. They put, they send a truck. The truck has a big horn on top with a speaker and someone's inside the truck and they're saying, uh, in, in Yiddish, they'll say, Rabbi Kanievsky passed away. The Levi will be 
uh, at 10 o'clock tonight and 10 million people show up and they all have the funeral. By the way, they do funerals at night in Israel. They put lights, they do it at night, do it right away, as soon as possible. They've done funerals at uh, midnight. Well, by the way, did you know you can do a funeral on Yontif? You can do a funeral on Yontif, not on Shabbos, but Yontif. We don't do it here in North America. We, we wait because we're not supposed to be driving and taking cars. But let's say the burial was next door in my backyard. We're going to bury the person in my backyard. I got a cemetery here. You're supposed to actually bury them, even if it's Yontif. You're supposed to do it quickly. Leonard's saying, I hope he doesn't have a, a backyard. He's if I start digging with shovels, they're going to call the police. But you're not allowed to announce a funeral. So you don't send out Fay, the Baruch Dayan Emet. Do you know this happened to Rabbi Shaim? A few years ago, someone called him up and said, Rabbi, we want you to officiate. The funeral is going to be tomorrow at noon. Um, and uh, and uh, he said, OK, I'll be there for 12 noon. And they called him back and they said, oh, she had a turnaround. She's doing better now. So you're not allowed to announce a funeral. You're not allowed to hire you know, back in the old days, we had musicians and singers at funerals. We don't do that anymore now. We, we don't have that since the Beit HaMikdash. We are not allowed to hire the musicians or the singers for the funeral march until the person is dead. You do not close the person's eyes until the soul departs. So you know how when someone passes away, they try and close the eyes down. You don't try and say, oh, you know, you're almost dead, ma. It says, you're close enough. Let's close the eyes now. We'll do it now. It'll be easier for you. You're not allowed to do that. Anyone who closes the patient's eyes while the soul is departing is considered spilling blood and it's considered killing a patient. If you try to close their eyes before they've departed, it's killing a patient. Well, we know what that's called. Further, the Shulchan Aruch says, the immediate relatives cannot do kriya. You don't go Oi, and, and do kriya. You don't tear your garments or a ribbon until the person has passed away. You don't take your shoes off like you're in Shiva until the person has passed away. You don't start reciting and writing a hesped. I mean, I know people do that, but you're really not supposed to. You know, they start saying, oh, you know what? They're going to be gone tomorrow. I have to start thinking about the funeral. I'm going to start writing out all of my thoughts about what I'm going to say at the funeral. That is done all the time. We're not supposed to do it. And you don't start writing and saying a hesped. You can't bring, you're going to laugh at this, but this is what the Shulchan Aruch says. You can't bring the coffin into the house until they're dead. So the person's lying there and they're dying and I'm going, okay, let's bring the coffin in here. This is the one we're going to use. You know, funeral homes, you do not have to buy their coffin. I'm, I'm, you, you think you do. You can go and get your own coffin. You can get a kosher coffin if you want at Walmart and bring it to them. By Jewish, not just Jewish law, but by civil law, they have to accept it. You know that. They, they, if you bring your own coffin to a funeral home, by law, they have to be, use it. But nobody does it. And nobody in our culture does it. We just buy... We're supposed to buy the simplest plain kosher uh, casket made the simplest. Okay, so if you're not bringing the coffin in to say, here, Ma, do you like this casket? Is this a pretty one for you? This is good. No, you don't do that. You cannot say Sidu Kadin until the soul has departed. What is the Tzidu Kadin? The Tzidu Kadin is the prayer that we say when we're lowering the casket. You hear the rabbi chanting these words, by the way, in our culture, we should say it in Hebrew and English. I try and do that because I want people who don't know Hebrew to know what we're saying. I, I, I take that very seriously. But the Tziduk Hadin, you know, what does Tziduk Hadin mean? Well, Tziduk from the word of uh, a Tzadik, of righteousness. And uh, Hadin is law. law. The, uh, we have a, a formula of words that we say called Tziduk Hadin when we lower a casket. So what are we saying through all of that that the Shulchan Aruch says? What is the bottom line for all of that? The bottom line is that since the person is entirely alive, the person is considered to be alive, you can't do anything 
which would be disheartening to the patient. I don't have to explain that. You can't do anything that is disheartening to the patient. Now, that's what Rav Yosef Karo says. Rav Yosef Karo wrote, he is known as the Machaber, and he wrote the Shulchan Aruch. There's always an Ashkenazi opinion. By the way, does anybody know anything about the history of the Shulchan Aruch, a little bit about the whole idea of the Ramah and what happened? The Ramah is Rav Moshe Isserlis, represents the Ashkenazic authority. Well, I'll give you just a tiny little bit of background. I might have told you this before, but it's, it's interesting. At the time when Rav Yosef Kara was writing the Shulchan Aruch, based on the tour, all the laws, he didn't know and didn't care. There it is. Larry, hold up the Ramah. <clears throat> I'll have to buy that book. I'll have to get it. Very interesting. Okay. So um, he was writing his own version of a commentary, right? Wasn't he? I think, Larry. And, and he didn't know. He didn't care. He wrote his own Shulchan Aruch. And you know what happened? I'm writing a book called Charlotte's Web. I don't know if somebody else wrote it. And I write the book called Charlotte's Web. And all of a sudden, I'm just about to, you know, I'm, I'm doing it slowly. I'm taking a few years to do it. I'm thinking about it, you know, the, what, what's going to happen with the spider and the pig, and I don't know. And all of a sudden, boom, E.B. White puts it out because he wrote it faster than me. I go, what the heck just happened here? I've been spending four years working on Charlotte's Web, and he has a book he just put out called Charlotte's Web. What am Rabbi, I going to do now? Rabbi Carroll's came out just before Ramaz came out. Exactly. So everybody, so everybody accepted uh, Yosef Carroll's. So everybody says, oh, we already got the Carroll. What do we need another right. Shulchan Aruch for? We already have one. Right. So now Is Israelis is holding his books, and he's going, what do I do now? So he ended up it's like a commentary it, it's it's a, added to the shulchan Aruch. so he's very a very important uh authority um but it's 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 and it's not a oh it's not necessarily i won't call it a commentary on the shulchan Aruch. i'm going to say it's an addition it's his thoughts based on shulchan Aruch. but you know if israelis would have worked a little faster and put it out first he would have it would be a different world today some things would be even more strict and some things would be more lenient, you know, because some of the Spartic opinions are a little bit more lenient. So the Ramah, namely the Ashkenazim uh, poskim, represents all of the Ashkenazic authority, says you cannot dig a grave for a person until the person is dead. Okay. So then I started thinking, if he's saying you can't dig a grave for a person until they're dead, then how come in the winter time when you go to the community section at Pardes Chaim and Pardes Shalom and you look carefully, you'll see boards on top of open graves. They're not open because they're closed with a board. There's all these graves and in Winnipeg especially they have to do it. They dig graves in advance because it's too frozen below the frost line. They can't dig it. They can't open it up. They can't get to it. The, there's already they go oh we're going to predict there's going to be 30 funerals this winter so let's dig 30 graves and cover them up with boards and when we need it we'll take the board and then we can just fill it in afterwards well does that go against halacha that the grave is already dug for the person no larry's right i saw the no it doesn't because it wasn't dug for that person with the intention specifically for that person it was dug for could be for uh, for anybody else, anybody. It's just a hole at this point. Correct. It's a hole in the ground. It's not a grave dug for a specific person. But I thought it was interesting because it, they are already pre-dug. Somebody might make a fuss and say they don't like it. In any event, it's usur. It's forbidden to leave an open grave until the next day. So they validate it by not leaving it open they cover it with a board. They've just made a hole, but it's covered. Besides, just leaving an open hole without a board on it is what? It's, it's something we call dangerous. It's not something you want to do. You don't want to be walking around a field and you fall into a hole. Similarly, the Ramah says it's prohibited to cause the dying person 
that he or she die quicker. So not everybody's going to like what I'm saying here. Because some of you might say, I want the person to die quicker. If I'm that person, what do I want to prolong something if I'm suffering? If I'm not well, why do I want to do that? Right? Similarly, it's not allowed to, it's prohibited to cause a dying person. So now what happens if you're not allowed to make the person die quicker? How do we get around a term helping to die someone quicker? If someone was on the verge of dying, and Larry said that that person is a gosess, for a long time, and that person is lying there, and they're suffering, and the person just is not dying, they're not dying. They're suffering. The patient cannot separate their own body from their soul. The person's lingering. We were taught by Rav Yosef Karo that you're not allowed to remove the pillow from underneath the person's head because people believe that certain feathers of certain birds will keep you alive. So there was a mystique, there was a a belief. People believed all kinds of things in the old days. You know, in the Gemara, if you had a bad dream, they said that you could maybe take the ashes of a black cat and sprinkle it around your bed. When was the last time you took a black cat's ashes and sprinkled around your bed? But in the time of the one. So our rabbis today say we're not allowed to follow any of those practices anymore. We don't follow those kinds of things. But, you know, back then they had a belief. I don't know which feathers it it was because I didn't hear it from them themselves. But they said maybe it was goose feathers. Maybe they felt that goose feathers were like beneficial to the person's health and they were keeping the person alive. Well, if you're lying on a goose feather pillow and it's helping you stay alive, I can't say, you know what? Let me just take away the goose feather pillow and let them just lie on a foam pillow. I'll just take it away and let them lie on a foam pillow. That would be better and it'll help them die quicker. Uh -uh. Uh-uh, uh-uh. You're not allowed to move the patient from his or her location while they are dying. So we made a statement that a gosess, I'm going to let you speak, Larry. We made it, we made it, we made a rule that a gosess is a person who is dying, about to die. And then I just said that we're not allowed to move the patient from his or her location while they were dying. This creates problems all over the place, especially in hospitals like Shari Tzedek in Yerushalayim, where it's considered to be a Torah observant emergency room. Go ahead, Larry. <clears throat> According to Halacha, you're not supposed to touch a goseth. It's forbidden oh. to even touch a goseth. But of course, it's also forbidden to do any positive action that will cause a person to die there's there's a lot of discussion as to whether or not a negative action like ventil like ventilation or something like that right. do you start them on it but, but but that's a whole other topic but but you're not allowed to touch a gosef according to halacha right so what happens about staff they have an access to an emergency room there's traffic back and forth everybody's being moved they need to get access very quickly what happens if a patient is brought in on a gurney and they've established right there on the gurney that this patient is dying one is not allowed to roll you're not allowed to take the gurney and roll it anywhere until they die because rolling the gurney might hasten death it might speed it up do you see how complicated it is we are going to be several weeks away from the um actual way that we're going to be able to help it's going to take us a few weeks to, to go through this because we're not studying it every day i mean you can on your own but till i get there 
And uh, I can promise you, even while I'm on vacation, I'm very excited. If I'm up north, I'm still going to have these classes. I have Starlink up there. I'll do it from the cottage because it's important to me um, that, that we, can, we continue. I don't want to have a big, long break. But I can tell you right now, it's not as simple as it sounds because they, they, they said, they said uh, according to the Ramah, you can't put the keys to the shul under the patient's head. What does that mean? You're laughing, Larry. You can't put, the, not who wants the keys to the shul, Faye. It's a big burden, right? Nobody even wants it. It says you can't put the keys to the shul under the patient's head. Okay, so what that statement means is that they were believing back then that the keys to the shul would enable the soul to depart and, and the heavens to uh, take over more quickly. So how do we conclude with this idea today, this part of where we're going? If there's something there, there is something there which is blocking or impeding the departing of the soul. So the, 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 the key word is impeding. Something is blocking, stopping, preventing the soul from departing. For example, I, I talked about this in one of my other shiurim. So you'll, you might remember the story. Next door, there's a wood chopper. Do you remember the wood chopping story? Okay. Anybody? Leonard, don't you remember the wood chopping story? No. Does anybody want to hear the wood chopping story? All right. Next door, there's a wood chopper. And um, the patient is lying in bed and they're upset by this constant hucking and clunking by this wood chopper. Chop, chop, chop. It's rhythmic. You know, a wood chopper does things in like a rhythm. You have to get a, a momentum, a rhythm. It's not like chop, 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 chop. Chop. It, there's a rhythm to chopping, like everything in life. And this constant hucking, you've heard the kind uh, nish, what is it? Huck mir nish da chinik. Don't bang for me a tea kettle. My mother used to say that to me when I'd bug her. Give me, I need more money, ma. I need more money. I want to buy, I don't know, what am I buying? Blue clogs and white pants. I want to buy, I want to buy ice cream, whatever it is. I don't huck me a chinik. I never knew what it meant, but when I found out later on that the chinik meant like a tea a teapot, and, and she said, and she don't bang. I thought that was hysterical. The best there's no explanation in English that is as good as the Yiddish, I think. But anyway, it's huck me near nishta chinik. This constant chopping of the wood is upsetting the person so much that it's doing the opposite of what you'd think. You think I'd say, please, God, let me die already if I have to listen to this. I'm a ghost. I'm lying in bed. I'm dying. But because it's upsetting me so much that I'm intent, I'm concentrating on this. It's rhythmic. It won't leave me alone. It won't go away. It's actually keeping the patient alive. That's what they believed. Their emotional intention can keep you alive for a very long time. Now, in my 29 years, I can't tell you how many times that I have seen somebody wait for someone to arrive from wherever it is in the world to see that person before they let go and die. I don't care if you tell me it's not true, it's a coincidence. I've seen it way too many times that people try and hang on to see someone or they hang on for different reasons or whatever it is. Um, they don't wanna die on someone's birthday. And then I hear the opposite story that maybe they do wanna die on the person's birthday, who knows? What the point is, is that there, with, with a, a human being, intent, intention can keep you alive for a long time. Imagine an old Jewish grandmother. 
who has devoted her whole life to just everything is for her family. We hear it, you know, this old lady, all she cared about was, will there be enough Canadian luck for Friday night for 12 people that are coming for dinner? I better make 32. You know, will there be enough? She cooked and she sewed and she's done everything and it's all been selflessly for her family. And she's been doing it since she was 20 years old, since she's 20 years old. And now she's elderly and suffering and feels deep down in her heart that if she dies, she'll be a failure to her family because that tension could keep her alive for a very long time, despite her suffering. She might be suffering. If I die today, there'll be no cholent on Shabbos. Who's gonna sew Mickey's dress for the wedding? She needs the hem longer. I have to do it. And all of these intentions and reasons if her family could gather around and tell her that her departing, her leaving this world would be the solution to her suffering. And if she could calm down, then she could die. I've seen that many times where family members saying, um, dad, it's okay. We're here. We love you. It's okay, you've done everything for us in this world. Bubby, you've done everything for us. You've sewed, you've cooked, you've cleaned. It's time for you to be at peace. You're giving the person permission. You know, as I said that word, Noreen said it at exactly the same second in sync with me. This is the beauty of Zoom. I, it was a, like we were in sync. She said it, the, the permission, you're giving someone in a sense permission. That sound of that Hakmira Chinik wood chopper who's outside banging on the wood, he's annoying. He's annoying and he's keeping the person alive. And if he would stop chopping, she could calm down and she could just die peacefully. I'm going to leave off with one other thought, which used to happen back in the old days. I don't know if you've ever heard about this, but there was something where they would um, believe that something else that could impede death was a lump of salt on the tongue. We don't do that today. That a lump of salt, if you put a lump of salt, uh, uh, like a blo- you know, salt and, and sugar in the old days, we didn't have it like this in boxes where it was all little crystals and fancy little, we just take it for granted. We use the salt shaker and everything. You know, salt was, you had to grind it. You put it into a, a grinder. Do I have one here? An old grinder? I have one somewhere upstairs. Anybody have the old wooden coffee grinders? You can put salt and you can put pepper. I have one of those. So you, you, um, you, uh, you, you would take that lump of salt and you would grind it. So a salt was a lump. It was a commodity. By the way, it was expensive. You know, if you go to Pioneer Village and they show you a lump of sugar, they said like this was a, an expensive commodity. We take it for granted today. You know, $1.99, you buy, well, maybe it's $3.99 now, but you buy a bag of sugar. But it, yeah, everything's gone up. Did you, did you hear today milk is going up again with inflation? That was a big fancy thing, a cup of tea with sugar or salt. They would take salt and they put this lump of salt on the tongue to help the person to stay around. It would agitate or cause uh, a feeling that would help you not die. Well, that lump of salt is preventing a person from departing. Today, today, in our times, in modern times, what is that lump of salt? Larry knows. Because you already brought it up a couple minutes ago. The ventilating machine. Larry already brought it forward. The respirator. The respirator. You took it away it, from me before earlier, right? It's a, uh, it's a whole deep, talk, uh, deep topic of whether or not 
or when you can turn it on or turn it off. And uh, there's a lot of discussion between Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein and Rabbi Auerbach as to when you can do it, what you can do. It's a whole topic. It's really problematic. And you're right. So that lump of salt today in our times, we're going to call it a respirator, a ventilator. Um, so if that machine is keeping a person alive, let's take an example. Here's one more thought. Blood pressure medication. Blood pressure medication maintains blood pressure, which prevents a person's death. We don't think of it that way, but why do you take it? Why, why, am I right, Dr. Shimmer? I think so. If you're taking blood pressure medication, I think it's helping us prevent death. These well, would yes. be, huh? But that's why we take it. <laughs> Correct. That's why we take it. So I think these are the parallel terms today. Back then it was a lump of salt. Today it's a ventilator, it's blood pressure medic. So what happens now? Like we're, we're in 2022. Is it permitted to remove these things which are impeding death? Leonard says no. Leonard, is it permitted to remove these things which are impeding death? Larry's ready to talk already. Okay, go ahead, Leonard. Wait, let, let, let's hear from Leonard. When when my father was in the hospital, um, they asked me if I wanted to put uh, intravenous, add back intravenous to his uh, to his medicate to his uh, uh, procedures, and uh, I spoke to the rabbi who not our rabbi, but his rabbi happened to be in the hospital, and he said if you put it on now. And you take it off later, it's tantamount to causing right. death. So that's why I said no. That's correct. But that's right. not putting it on in the first place. Right. right, right, right. So I'm talking about something else. So let me go back for a second to the wood chopper, <clears throat> just for a second. Go and tell the wood chopper, go and tell the wood chopper to go away for a couple of hours. Take a coffee break, sit on the grass. Here's a blanket, relax, have a cigarette if that's what you do, you're a wood chopper and relax and just sit there and don't do any chopping for a couple of hours. You've worked so hard, you deserve a break. That's similar to plucking the salt off the tongue. Now the patient can die. That's what you should do, no. remove whatever it is that is blocking death. Now, <laughs> what does that even mean? We're not there yet. We're not there. We're not there today. We'll get there. Remove whatever it is that's blocking death. If the wood chopper is chopping and the person is intent and says, oh my God, that noise is killing me. They're so intent, they're not dying. The wood chopping noise stops. You're not touching the patient. You're not removing the pillow from under them by telling the wood chopper to take a break. I'm telling the wood chopper, you've chopped wood for eight hours. Go and take a break. He stops chopping and the person goes, Hi. and then they can die. No, no, no. Well, according to the sources, yes. But we'll get there. Why? There's a difference between removing something that's preventing death and helping someone to die. So you're allowed to tell the wood chopper to stop chopping if it helps the person die. That's not bringing in the casket. That's not removing the pillow from underneath the person's head. So what is the difference? between these cases where we are instructed that it's correct to do whatever it is that's necessary, we're instructed by our post scheme to do whatever it is that's necessary to allow the patient to die by removing the impediment of death, 
And we're going to get more scientifically into this. Wait until we get into pacemakers and all of this. Wait, that's yeah. still better. I'm not there yet. So we are instructed that it's correct to do what is necessary to allow the patient to die right now by removing the impediment of death. Think about what Larry said for a moment, just before we leave off about the ventilating machine. Switch off the ventilating machine. What about meds being infused drop by drop through an IV? Stop the infusion. And if you stop the infusion, the person will die and they're going to end their suffering. I didn't say yes or no, Larry. I'm saying that this is a thought here. We're talking from the Ramah here. These are not actions which are hastening death, but rather they are removing the impediments which are preventing death. These are not actions which are causing the person to die. Stopping the wood chopper is not going to cause the person to die. It's removing the impediment that is preventing the person from dying. So here we have a fundamental idea. We have an idea here. And then I'm going to let you speak because I want to hear what you say. The fundamental idea is that although it's forbidden, it's prohibited to perform any kind of action at all. We're not allowed to perform an action which is going to hasten death. On the other hand, we have some, someone which we started at the beginning, which we called a gosses. We have a gosses, which is a person who is terminally ill. The person is terminally ill and the person is suffering. It is correct to remove the impediment of death, to remove what is preventing them from dying in order to allow the patient to die naturally now. So if I per stop, if I tell the wood chopper, stop chopping, stop chopping, and the person naturally can die, we've opened up a door to a certain kind of euthanasia. We've opened a door to a certain way of allowing someone to die with dignity by asking the wood chopper to stop chopping. We've opened the door for the person to die naturally by um, um, removing that impediment, uh, switching off the ventilating machine. The ventilating machine is preventing the patient from dying. So we're just gonna switch off the machine. No, no. All right, so Larry says no. We'll talk about yes or no more. We'll go in through it more. Um, but go ahead, Larry. Tell us why no on your side, and then we'll 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 uh, investigate it more, and we'll continue next week. It depends which pasuk you're dealing with. Moshe Feinstein would say that that if a person's on a ventilator, and the and the nurse every day has to turn off the ventilator in order to, to clean it or to adjust it or to do something, Moshe Feinstein's position is that you don't necessarily have to turn it back on again if the person's in pain. But Rabbi Arbach says that it's all one continuous uh, um, treatment and you have to turn it back on again. Uh, your comment about uh, uh, Removing an impediment, I'll give you the story that one rabbi talked about was if a person's in a, in a well and there's a ladder, if you remove the ladder, is that permitted if the person and the person will, will die in the, uh, in the well? So there's a whole concept there. Okay, so we may get to the um, Rav Auerbach next week. Um, I, in fact, you know what? We will. We'll talk a little bit about the beginning in the arguments by Rav Shlomo Zalman Auerbach. Is that who you're talking about, Rav Shlomo Zalman? Yes. 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 So, so Rav Shlomo Zalman Auerbach argued a lot with uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein. They were friends. But uh, just to know, 
sometimes I look outside of the only their sources as well. I really value the Orach HaShulchan, Rav Michal Epstein, and I also value highly the Tzitz Eliezer. And we're going to speak about Rav uh, Yehuda Eliezer Waldenberg and what he says, because don't forget, that was his world. He was the halachic authority at um, in a Torah observant hospital to Shari Tzedek. A lot of the things that he said, by the way, people didn't like. Shlomo Zalman didn't like. Rav Yosef didn't like. Rav Moshe Feinstein didn't like. But he is a medical authority. And sometimes we have to listen to medical authorities too. But we'll, we're going to go back. We're going to, we're going to next week. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at the differences between the prohibited kinds of assisted suicide. We'll call it that for now. Or helping someone to die and the permitted kinds, the difference between what is prohibited and what is permitted. And how do you know in real cases exactly what to do? So we're going to have to go back to the Shulchan Aruch, and we're going to have to look at the two principal commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch, which is the Taz, um, who is from Germany, representing Jews of Western uh, Europe. And we're going to have to look at the Shach. The Shach is also a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch uh, from Poland, representing uh, Jews from Eastern Europe. And there's a controversy between the Shach and the Taz. Isn't there always a controversy between the Shach and the Taz, the, the Ashkenazi and the Sephardic authorities? And once we do that, then we'll take a look at what Rav Shlomo Zalman Auerbach, we'll get into modern times a little bit more, and we'll definitely look and see what he says. But for today, we're going to leave it off that according to the Ramah, according to the Ramah, the book that you held up in a sense, Larry, which I highly regard, so back then in his thinking, and Rav Moshe Feinstein was not an expert in medical ethics, but he was an expert in halacha, that the actions which are hastening death, but rather removing the impediments which are preventing death, are allowed, according to the Ramah. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that we follow that. I'm just going through the sources. We're going to look next week at the Shach and the Taz, the two principal commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch, and then we're going to go forward and we're going to look at Rav Shlomo Zalman Arbach, since you brought it up, Larry, because uh, it's very important. So we, we're going to get there uh, together, and then we're going to we're going to uh, uh, we're going to come to some conclusions together, and we're going to follow what is correct. And and uh, and and by the way, what is correct for one person is not necessarily correct for another, right? So let's keep in mind that um, uh, halacha is a art, not necessarily always only a science. So we'll go from there. But thank you so much for sharing time today. I I, I just love this, and uh, it's a very interesting topic to me, anyway. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Marsha. Thank you, Marsha. Thank you, Marsha. A lot, lot of food for thought. A lot of food for thought, right. I'll see you soon at 12. Yeah. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, Marshall. Bye, thank you. Thanks, Larry. <clears throat> thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ava. Thank you, John.